Hi, friends. Greg Kokel here on Stand to Reason, and uh, it's nice to be with you today. I have some thoughts about something going on in the culture that's, uh, well, it's, um, this is just one iteration of a serious problem that we've seen a lot of that I want to just speak to. Um, I think that the concern about, um, what's the best way to put this? Well, I, uh, the, the concern about racism has gotten out of control. Maybe that's not the best way to put it, because I have a concern about racism. But I have a concern about a lot of things that, in themselves, in, independently, individually, are really good and important things, but can get out of control. Uh, I have a, a concern about our gender dysphoria is out of control. All right? Uh, people who suffer from gender dysphoria... Um, are in an utterly tragic situation um, th- because they are always going to be broken. People who experience gender dysphoria know something's wrong. This is why they say, for example, I'm a woman in a man's body. That ain't right. Something's wrong. Now, they think the thing that's wrong is their body, and so they want to change it, and culture is giving them Uh, free reign to do that, even apart from parents' uh, approval when it comes to children or or a man and a woman's body, and then they they have radical mastectomies, whatever. So this is a a legitimate and appropriate concern that has gotten out of control. And I think the same thing has happened with the area of the concept of equity— racial equity, because all kinds of things that are are happening now in the name of that that are actually uh, abusive and uh, and, uh, and oppressive. I have an article here about the uh, Art Institute of Chicago. That's actually a place my daughter would like to go because she's interested in art, and she's worked at her craft, my 16-year-old, and she's showed some promise. Um, but this doesn't have to do with students at the Art Institute. It has to do with docents. You know who docents are, right? They're trained volunteers who greet visitors and who guide them through the collections, and they fill in details of the artist's lives. They talk about visual elements of the work on display. They add art history information. you got to know a lot to be a docent. Uh, docents aren't just people who stand there and say, yeah, the... The men's room is there and the women's room is over there. Uh, Picassos are on the third floor. Uh, Rembrandt's down the hall on the left. That's not that's not a docent. That's a, what do you call that? What's that just? A docent is somebody who knows something about art and can guide you re, with regards to the exhibits. They're very important if you are attending an art museum like the Art Institute of Chicago. You want some help. And there they are to help out. Now, most of these people are, uh, almost all of them are volunteers. And this is their way of giving service to the community. How can they volunteer? How can they know so much about, about art and volunteer to help people? Well, most of them have independent means so they they have the resources financially to donate their time and to and to explain uh or to to offer their knowledge which in many cases is extensive and their experience with art for the benefit of those going through but you know like lots of things it's come under the racial microscope So this headline says, In Indocency on Display at the Art Institute of Chicago. Now that's a play on word, because indocency means some error or mistake, but it's a it's 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 also a play on docents because they have dismissed would be the nice way of saying fired their docents 
virtually all of them. And that's a tragedy, and that's why this play on words, indocency, no docents, and bad, on display at the Art Institute of Chicago. Subheading sub here, this is Faith Bottom, and I apologize, I, I don't have the bib source for this. I printed it out, but I didn't have the bib source somewhere online. The museum fired all its volunteer greeters and guides because most were white women with above average means. That's the subtitle. The Art Institute of Chicago has 300,000 works of art and zero docents. Okay. Used to have 100 of them. Now I'm reading here basically from the article. 82 of them active until Veronica Stein, an executive director of learning and engagement, sent a September 3 email canning all of them. In gratitude for their long, unpaid service, averaging 15 years each. You hear that? 15 years each, average. The Art Institute offered the involuntary retired guides a two-year free pass to the museum. You think any of these people, after serving their 15 years, are going on a pass to come back to the place that just summarily fired them because they had the wrong skin color? It's Wall Street Journal. Thank you. Faith Bottom, Wall Street Journal, October 15. That's the full bib source. Thank you, Kyle. Actually, it probably came from Amy. Kyle held up the sign. Teamwork. The apparent problem was that the Art Institute docents were mostly older white women of above-average financial means and with plenty of time on their hands. That's kind of the point, isn't it? Got to have the time to do the work. The Institute needs to be A more professional model, Ms. Stein explained, and here's the citation or quote, rather, in a way that allows community members of all income levels to participate. Response to issues of class and income equity and does not require financial flexibility. What do you mean does not require financial flexibility? These were volunteers. So is the Art Institute going to pay them now? They're going to pay people of color when they had plenty of people already trained that were doing a great job but didn't have enough rainbow in the color spectrum there. When I say now, probably not the best word. Didn't have enough people of color. Rainbow implies sexuality, so don't mean that. But have financial flexibility. (laughs) They don't need to be paid. Oh. There's an army of very highly skilled docents. Um, Gigi Vafis, the president of the Docent Council, says that are re- willing and ready and able to continue with arts education. Now, let's say um, there was a letter protesting their firing. The docents noted that each of them had, quote, engaged in 18 months. Watch this. 18 months of twice a week training to qualify as a docent. Five years of continual research and writing to meet the criteria of 13 museum content areas and monthly and biweekly trainings to further educate themselves with the materials, processes, and cultural context of the Art Institute's collection. So it sounds to me like the Art Institute cut off its nose to spite its face. These people have been volunteered an average of 15 years at no charge with plenty of education and had dutifully done everything that was necessary for them to be skilled as docents to serve the community. And they were canned because they, well, the group wasn't racially and, and financially diverse enough, apparently. Does that, that sound out of control? to you? Incidentally, it says here, this citation I just offered was from Dietrich Clevern, a docent since 2012, and she was the only docent who agreed to speak to the journal, rejecting the Institute's request that they not talk to the media. media. This is another thing that just blows my mind. Does the does the um, Art Institute of Chicago think they're doing a good thing. 
Well, they must think they are. And they cited their rationale that has to do with equity. Then why are they telling people not to talk to the media? If the Art Institute is doing something noble and defensible, they should be shouting it from the rooftops. Here's what we do. Here's what we did. Isn't this great? Look at the great thing we're accomplishing. We are very noble. We are proud of what we've done. Why are they telling the docents not to talk to the media? Because this is characteristic of the left, silence, dissent. Apparently, their request, who knows how much teeth that had from the Art Institute, but their request was heeded by everyone but one, Dietrich Cleborn. Um, and she talked to the media, in this case, the Wall Street Journal. Apparently, on September 27th, in the Chicago Tribune, there was a blistering editorial criticizing the Art Institute's actions as shameful and done in a weaselly way. I get that. But that was one of the few members, uh, mentions rather, of the story in Chicago area media. And the chairman of the Art Institute replied to the Chicago Tribune, Robert Levy, and he said his... He defended the decision of his professional staff to dismiss amateur volunteers. He defended the decision of his professional staff to dismiss amateur. I mean, really, adding insult to injury when they had all 18 months of training twice a week, classes, all that stuff that they did. Well, of course, they're amateur. They're not being paid because they're giving their time, but they're not nobodies. They're They're dismissed it. The amateur volunteers, though they were given no warning before being fired, he insisted that the plan had been in the works for 12 years. 12 years? Really? And then he says, Critical self-reflection and participatory recuperative action is required if we are to remain relevant to the changing audiences seeking seeking connection to art. Close quote. Huh? What a bunch of baloney. Critical self... This is a citation from Mr. Levy, chairman of the Art Institute. Here's why we fired all of these wonderful people. Critical self-reflection and participatory recuperative action is required if we are to remain relevant to the changing audiences seeking connection to art. I thought people seeking connection to art are seeking connection to art. Why do they care what color the docet is to give them information about the art they're seeking connection? Do you see how nonsense this is? Let's see. Apparently, uh, the docents were not demographically representative population. That's the concern for racism gone cuckoo. Museum appears to be be in the grips of a self-defeating overcorrection, this author who wrote the piece writes. It has adopted the language of diversity, inclusion, and equity so completely that it was willing to fire the same upper-middle-class volunteers it relies on for charitable donations. It's even worse than that, though. If they are interested in diversity, inclusion, and equity, then why do they fire all the white people? Uh, This happens all the time. Well, anyway, okay, enough of that. Crazy, crazy, crazy. All right, let's go to, oh, I have one more thing to say, and another thing to that. Uh, What I did was, it did occur to me as I listened to this kind of stuff, and maybe this sounds like politics to some people, but this is relevant to living a moral life, because this is oppression. Are we concerned about oppression? This is racism. These women were fired because they were white. Now, they were only volunteers, so you can't really call them fired because they weren't actually getting paid, but they were fired as volunteers and very capable. So I thought, is that legal? Wasn't there a thing called the Civil Rights Act of 1964? 
And I think that a lot when I see all kinds of things like this happening in cases where people are actually getting fired because they refuse to be subject to the indoctrination of their employers on political issues. And I I just wish more people would say something about this. By the way, when I was at Seattle last weekend, I had two people this happens almost every time, tell me about their experiences with this kind of thing. How they are being required by their employers to embrace, essentially, critical race theory in different forms as a criterion, as a requirement for employment. And I'm just giving you a line, dear friends. It's entirely legitimate to ask your employer who makes this requirement Why must I be indoctrinated by your political point of view as a requirement of employment? What justifies you threatening me with the loss of my employment because I will not listen, I will not be indoctrinated in these courses, etc., by your politics? And by the way, that's just what this is. It is politics. Why... Why is that? It's a fair question. Why is that? I'm interested in what they would say. I know some have said, well, my employer says he's just trying to create a better work environment. Right? Really? When white people are not allowed to speak because they've already had 200 years of being in charge so they can't speak, that's better work pitting blacks against white and white against black? Bearing false witness against people, calling them racists because of their skin color. This is improving the work environment. Anyway, here's the uh, Civil Rights Act of 1964. I looked it up. June 63, John Kennedy asked Congress for a comprehensive civil rights bill. He didn't survive long enough to get it passed, but LBJ did. And in 1964, Congress passed Public Law 88-352, parentheses 78, stat 241, close paren, also known as the Civil Rights of 1964. It prohibits discrimination on the basis of race, color, religion, sex, or national origin. There you go. Provisions of the Civil Rights Act forbade discrimination on the basis of sex, as well as race, in hiring, promoting, and firing. Now, this is a summary, of course. It also uh, prohibited the discrimination in public accommodations in federally funded programs, so you couldn't say blacks on this water fountain and whites on this one. But wait a minute. Isn't Isn't that what we're doing? Isn't that what's going on, in a certain sense, at the uh, Chicago... Art Institute? Prohibits discrimination on the basis of race, color, religion, sex, or national origin. Oh, maybe there's an end around here. We weren't paying them. Well, wait a minute. You weren't paying them, but you will not let them participate because they're the wrong color. And you can gussy it up with all kinds of fancy schmancy language, like that really obtuse sentence that I read twice. It doesn't change it. It's discrimination based on sex and race and or color. All right, there it is. I'm curious when somebody's going to start litigating against these kinds of things based on a violation of the Civil Rights Act of 1964, which was huge and changed the face of, 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 of discrimination in this country. And now we're back there 50 years later. We're back there. Okay. Uh, let's go to New Jersey. And I want to say Joycey. Is that what your name is? Is it Joycey? Yes, Greg. Hey, you forgot about me already. I talked to you last week. <laughs> oh, I am so sorry. Well, the reason I'm just, yeah. yeah. Okay, you know, it's like old timer's disease, you know. It's okay. Okay, but I I'm looking, it. it says, thank you, sweetheart. Joycey <laughs> from New Joycey. That's right, remember? That's right. Did I say that last week, too? That's what you said. 
sense. Oh, my goodness. Exactly. Okay. I'm really in bad shape right now. Okay, Joycey no, from New Jersey. I'm so glad you called back. I've been thinking about hey. you all week long. <laughs> yes, of course you are. I am calling to, tonight. Um, <clears throat> I listened to that whole bit. I'm glad you uh, brought that to my attention about the Chicago uh, thing. It's ridiculous. And I actually, um, one thing, when you mentioned about they're not rainbow enough. I think that's part of it too now because from what I've been observing over here in New Jersey, uh-huh. um, the rainbow, you know, people, the pride people, right. the LGBTQ um, population, that's the new affirmative action group. Right. There. <laughs> right. Well, so this is, I mean, what? I guarantee you that they're going to, okay, oh, we don't have enough. Um, all, all these white women, so now that you have a problem with the women, mm-hmm. not only that they're white, so now we need guys, and they're going to be LGBTQ men, and I guess they might try well, to find you know, some uh, Frankly, I don't, ca- I don't care if, if gay people <laughs> are docets as long as they're qualified, but they just fired <laughs> almost every single one of them who it's are eminently so, qualified uh, and went through years of know, training and years of service, it, and so it's now wrong. what? I'm, I'm really, it just really... It, it hurts my head. Mm-hmm. So, but yeah, uh, when you said that, I thought, you know what? I'm sure that's part of it too. Um, mm-hmm. And it's just ridiculous that um, there was this whole, um, what is it, feminist movement and women and blah, whatever, whatever. And it's all women, but that's, you can't keep some of the women. Like, well, yeah. anyway, uh, it hurts my head. Yeah. Anyway. Yeah. <laughs> so, I am calling. Uh, to ask you a question about Colossians chapter 1, 19 to 20. Okay, I got it right here. And I was curious about this. Um, I'm not sure, I forget how it even came up. But um, I, I I stumbled across it. I'm not even in Colossians right now, my, my, my Bible study. Mm-hmm. Now I'm confused as to how I... I anyway... Last week, even, while, uh, or just as your podcast ended, I was looking at this, and I just was kind of curious as mm-hmm. to what it was referring to when, in chapter 20, it says, and through him to reconcile to himself all things, whether on earth or in heaven, mm-hmm. making peace by the blood of his cross. So now, making peace in heaven, um, <clears throat> what does that refer to? Is there... Like in relation and in, in revelations, is, is there going to be a battle in heaven and still or because when I'm thinking of um, what's being reconciled to God through you know mm-hmm. the, the birth, death, and resurrection of Christ, I'm thinking of people. I'm thinking of you know the souls of men. So that's why I was just a little bit. Sure. I was wondering what that was referring to. Okay, just a just point of information in verse 20 here, where it says, on earth or things in heaven, um, literally it is in the heavens, or the heavenly places. That doesn't necessarily mean the abode of God. I have not studied oh, this oh. passage, but I think where Paul talks in Ephesians chapter 6 about our battle is not against flesh and blood, but against principalities in the heavenly places. So you have a material realm, flesh and blood, and you have an immaterial realm identified here, a spiritual immaterial realm called the heavenly places, where there are powers and principalities that are at war with God. So you yes. have this battle going on. Oh, okay. Okay? Mm-hmm. So I'm just going to offer a conjecture. I'm not going to be real dogmatic. It's just a conjecture here. But what you have you have in Colossians is you have a book that is about the preeminence of Christ. Christ is preeminent. He's first and foremost kind of thing. Mm-hmm. And, uh, and it says, going back to verse 15, he is the image of the invisible God. He is the firstborn, which means preeminent, not first birth. Yeah. Okay, but the preeminent one, uh, the monogenes, I think, is the word. It's not. A, it's not two words. It's one. So, and by him, all things were created. We see in verse sixteen. There's a lot of background noise going on. Is that? I'm sorry. I'm so. Uh, it's a squeaky door. 
<laughs> oh, okay. Boy, sometimes it sounds like the door is stronger than my voice there. Um, okay, good. That's better. By him all things were created, both in heaven and earth. So it's just exalting Jesus. He is before all things, and in him all things hold together. He's the head of the body, the church, the firstborn from the dead, first one resurrected, okay, uh, that he will have first place in everything. He he was humbled, now he's being given first place again, for is the Father's good pleasure that all the fullness dwell in him and to reconcile all things to himself. Okay, now, there are... Um, all things are all things. The world's a mess. He is before yeah. all things, and in him all things hold together, but they are not reconciled to him Him yet. We have chaos, which is why the kingdom is preached, because the kingdom is God's rulership over all that is right, rightfully his, which is everything. But there's yeah. a rebellion afoot, and that rebellion mm-hmm. is also in the heavenly places. Okay. Yeah, okay. And mm-hmm. so then what Jesus is doing is he's bringing about a resolution of all of that chaos, which is going to result in peace, and he has done that through his blood on the cross. And yeah. he is bringing the resolution of the reconciliation or the peace to the chaos on earth and in the heavenlies. So he is going to defeat the foes in the heavenlies as well and right. create peace on earth, <laughs> so to speak. Okay. Totally right. and completely. Okay. We think of peace on earth, we mean we think, well, then people are all getting along and they're not having fights and wars. No, he means peace in the whole worldly system. It's going to be resolved, and that we see at the end of the book of Revelation. My sense is that is what's going on in this passage. Oh, okay. Well, yeah, that pretty much clears it up then. <laughs> yeah, well, that, that's one possible understanding, and I think it's from the words it seems a good one. Now, somebody may know a lot more about this passage and the Greek and the backgrounds and everything. They say, Kokel, you're all wet. Well, maybe, but I'm just giving it a shot from the text, okay? Jesus is the preeminent one over all things, and he is working to bring all things under his practical authority and rulership and bring peace, whether in the on earth or in the heavenlies, in the yes. heavenly realms. Mm-hmm. Okay. And um, it, this is, I guess, loosely related to what you were talking about in the um, first hour when you went into um, pre-trib and post-trib rapture, sort of. And I mean, well, it's kind of not related at all, but I, I wanted to say that if anybody were to read First Thessalonians, if you read First Thessalonians chapter four, right in verse fifteen and sixteen, it's pretty clear that um, there's no, there's not going to be two. Like there's no, you know, people. The people who are here are not going to leave, and then later. Jesus. It, it be says returned, there, yeah. Right. Well, it well, says in first, that I think it, it kind of spells it out. It says that we are who are alive, who are left until the coming of the Lord, will not precede those who have fallen asleep. Uh huh. The Lord Himself will descend from heaven, and the voice of an archangel right, and right. the sound of trumpet of God and the dead. And Christ will rise first. Then we who are alive, who are left, will be caught up together That's right. with them. Together with so they'll all of us together after Jesus Himself. I agree. I think that's um, pretty straightforward. You know, what's what's the mystery of this event in the resurrection? And this is what a lot of people don't understand. They say, "What's the point of going up just to come back again?" And my response is, "You don't understand the what the um, significance of this event." Everybody's going to be resurrected, but some people haven't died yet. Yes. And the significance is that some people get resurrected in a certain sense, even if they haven't died. So what he says in 1 Corinthians 15 is the perishable will put on the imperishable. That's the ones who are dead who come first. And then the mortal will put on immortality. So a living person goes from being mortal to being immortal. Therefore, there's a generation of people that are believers that will be here when Jesus visibly returns who will not die. 
they will be transformed into immortality without having died and being resurrected to immortality. That's it. That's the that's the significance of these passages, First Thess four, and also First uh, Corinthians fifteen. Is yeah. that we are we shall not all die. We shall be changed in a moment, in a mm-hmm. twinkling of an eye. I, I, you're on to it. You're right about that. And to me, that's that just seems very very straightforward, not complicated at all. All right, yeah. it no. fits. Now, a lot of people don't like that. And when I talk, I, occasionally when people ask me in a Q&A in an audience and they ask me about the, re, the rapture and I say, well, that's not my, that I'm, uh, I'm not going there. I'm not, I don't believe in the rapture, at least the way you guys are talking about it. Right. And, and then I give a few reasons. Since they respect me, then they think, well, maybe he's right. And, he, and then they're scared. I can see the look on their face. Oh, my goodness. Because they're getting mm-hmm. this idea that nothing's going to bad happen to them. Nothing bad will happen to them. They're going to yeah. they're going to escape it all. Wait, Christians That's have, my been, view, actually, have been enduring but I'm yes, persecution for 2000 years. Right. Why? You know, why would we think we'd escape? Um, well, escape God's <laughs> wrath, I know that, but that's not what's in question here. So, right, exactly. Yeah, well, good. All right, uh, Joycey from New Jersey, and I will try to remember next time <laughs> I see it, oh, my old friend. No, you talk to a lot of people, Greg. Oh, no, I'm sorry I messed up, but next no, time no, I'll no. get it right, okay? <laughs> All right, Greg. It's always a treat to talk with you. Same here. Okay, Bye-bye. thanks, dear. Bye-bye now. All right. Well, look at I'm running out of stuff here, friends. That was my last caller for the hour. If you want to participate in the show, um, 855-243-9975 is the number. And generally during 4 and 6 on Tuesday evenings, Los Angeles time, you can call. But if you call now at 533, you won't get me. I'll be gone. So call early enough to get in the queue. We'll do a whole show. Thanks, friend. Greg Hochul for Stand to Reason. Give him heaven. Bye-bye.